Lord Jesus, this morning we invite you to be in this place. We invite you to speak to us, to be amongst us. Father, we thank you for, for the gift of, gift of your son, Jesus, and for what he's done for us. And Father, we thank you for your continued pursuit on our lives. And Father, we thank you that we can sing and praise your name this morning together as a family. And Father, this morning we invite the Holy Spirit to be here to speak to us. We pray an anointing over Pastor Randy, Lord, this morning, that every single word that comes out of his mouth, Father, that it comes from you. That's our prayer this morning, Lord, to hear from you. And Father, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Isn't it a nice day today? It was, like, it was really cool. Deanna had the whole house fan sucking in cool air. It was really great. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, there's a group of guys getting together for an outreach event on August 26th, and there's information over there in the library. It's a get-together, do some fun things, uh, lunch and breakfast together uh, starting at 8 o'clock. So there's information over there. Hope you might come uh, and think about that. Z World's coming up. If you didn't pick up a, uh, a postcard and hand it out and invite people to come, it's going to be great. We have had good help so far. If you want to help, I'd love to have your assistance in making this happen. You can speak to my wife. She's recruiting people. Donna King's recruiting people. Love to have some extra help. Um, having shared those announcements, just want to say one more thing. Video this morning. Um, Kathy and I sit down, we talk about the sermon and try to think about what creative thing might ha help uh, communicate the message of the day. And I've been talking, started last week talking about um, questions Jesus asked. Jesus asked 307 different questions in the scripture. I've been focusing on those questions. And the question I want to focus on today is, why do you have such evil thoughts in your heart? Why do you have evil thoughts in your heart? And that's a tough kind of subject. And Kathy struggled to find some uh, video or play that was right on the mark, but she did locate uh, a professor talking about overcoming negative thoughts. And at first glance, it might seem a, a little different than what I'm talking about, but it was very provocative, and it, it, it connects to the thoughts that we battle with sometimes. So here's a professor. Uh, talking about our thoughts, and then I'll be talking about why do I have such evil thoughts in my heart? Here we go. So that was interesting. And, and you can consider that, because uh, what I want to talk about this morning is our, our, our thoughts, how we process our thoughts. And I want to begin with one of Jesus' questions. Like I said last week, Jesus asked, according to somebody who counted them all, he asked 307 different questions in the Bible. And I'm going to talk about those questions this summer throughout the year. One thought that comes to my mind is, why do you think Jesus asked those questions? Why would he ask those questions? Didn't he know the answers? That doesn't make any sense, right? He asked the questions, I think, not because he didn't know the answer, but because he wanted to get us to think about the question that he was raising. And last week, one of the things I did was I took a chart, and I realized when I was sitting here, I forgot in the first service, I forgot in the second, I want to get the chart out again, I forgot. That's what happens. But uh, anyway, I, I drew four quadrants, if you were here last week, uh, with the young adult interns. We read this book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and it identifies four quadrants according to whether something is important or not important, urgent or not urgent. So the upper quadrant was important and urgent. And that's often what we spend a lot of time with, things that are important and urgent. Uh, things are always pressing me. I end up running around like a chicken with their head cut off, you know, going from one activity to another to another. Some things are important, not urgent. Some things are important, uh, are not important, excuse me. Some things are important, but they're not urgent. Some things are important, but not urgent. Um, I, I think they're important, but because they're not urgent, I don't get around to doing it. 
Some things are not important but urgent. Those are the things that really irritate me because they're people that say, hey, you got to really do this thing for me. And they press me and say, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. And, I, I, and it's very important to them, but it's not important to me, but it is urgent. And so I do it, and I do it to please them. And while I'm doing it, anybody ever have this experience? While I'm doing this particular thing, because it's so urgent to somebody else, and it's not important to me, it gets frustrating. And I say to myself inside my head, why am I doing this? Have you ever done that? Why am I doing this? That's annoying. That's it's not important, but it is urgent. And then the fourth quadrant over here is not important, not urgent. And you would say, well, why would anybody do that? And the answer in the book was you would do that when that's things like playing solitaire and wasting time. And the reason I do that is because I'm burned out over here in the urgent, important category. And I'm rushing, rushing, rushing. I need to just fry and I just check out and play solitaire. The author of the book says the most valuable quadrant to spend time in is this one over here, the, import, the important, not urgent quadrant, because that's the one that we tend to neglect. That includes things like exercise. Anybody think exercise is important? See, everybody thinks that's important. We know it's important, but it's not really urgent. You know what I mean? I think I'll go for a run today. No, I won't. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> Isn't that the way it works? It's important. But it's not urgent because it's not urgent and I don't end up doing it. And the author of the book says, I need, need, to, I need to devote time to the important, not urgent things because they really are important. Or anybody think it's important to read your Bible every day? Sure, it's very important, but it's not urgent. Not urgent. It doesn't matter if you don't do it. It, it just is always tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. Anybody think you ought to pour into your relationships, significant relationships in your life, spend time with them? Yeah, that's very important, but it's not urgent, and so we tend to neglect those kinds of things. That quadrant, second quadrant, important, not urgent. So when I looked at these questions, 307 questions Jesus asked in the scripture, he asked them not because he didn't know the answer, but to get us to think. And if Jesus considered it important enough to ask these questions, then it seems to me it's important, not urgent, but important for us to consider them. And so that's what I want to do this morning. The story this morning comes in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and Jesus is interacting with people. And at one point, some guy is brought to Jesus. Gospel of Luke and Gospel of Mark say they actually remove thatching in the roof. This guy is on a stretcher. Remember the story? And, and his four friends lower the stretcher down in front of Jesus, and he's paralyzed. Now, what do you expect Jesus to do about this guy? What do you expect Jesus? How do you think Jesus is going to respond? What do you think he's going to do? Guy's paralyzed. What's the primary need of the guy that's paralyzed? Yeah, heal him. That's what I'm thinking. He's going to heal the guy, right? So here's how the story goes. Because that's the obvious thing. The most important thing for this guy is healing. So here it says this. Guy's placed in front of Jesus says, Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. He didn't heal the guy. Why do you think he did that? He forgave the guy. Why do you think Jesus opted to forgive the guy rather than heal the guy? Why would he go that path? I think maybe... The greater need of the man was, was forgiveness rather than healing. I, I mean, you could argue that if you know the story, the Pharisees are going to attack Jesus, and maybe Jesus could have uh, healed or forgiven the guy just to set them up for a conflict, but I don't think that's the way Jesus works. I don't think Jesus does things to provoke a conflict with the Pharisees. I think the reason he healed, forgave the guy is because that's what the guy needed more than anything else. Back when Deanna and I were in college, the first three years that we were in college, every Sunday afternoon we had the same activity. From the very beginning, nearly the very beginning of college, we found out there was an opportunity to serve the Lord on a Sunday. So we went to church together, and, and after coming back from church, instead of eating in the cafeteria at the college, because the cafeteria wasn't open quite yet, it opened at two at that, on Sunday afternoons, we made peanut butter jelly sandwiches, took an apple, and we got in a van and we drove to a rode to a uh, place in Philadelphia, kind of nursing home type of environment called Inglis House. Anybody ever hear of Inglis House? Inglis House. And, and when we went to Inglis House, I always think about this thing that they just talked about in terms of labeling. The sign on the outside Inglis House, when we went to Inglis House every Sunday afternoon, said Inglis House, a home for incurables. Talk about a label. 
Like talk about 30% failure rate in a surgery. Inglis House, a home for incurable. So we went every Sunday afternoon to Inglis House and what we did was when we arrived, we would go around the facility and say, anybody want to come to church? We're going to wheel you to the church service. We were just volunteers, just a handful of us. And we wheeled them to a church service. And then after the service, I think the service started at 2, after the service was over, we'd wheel them back to their rooms. And then we left at 4 o'clock and we'd talk to them for a little bit of time. And Deanna and I would both gravitate to some people that were our favorite residents at Inglis House. Deanna's favorite resident was a woman named Margaret. My favorite resident was a guy named William Upsey. William Upsy didn't always come to the worship service, but I often would make sure I talked to William because he was just a nice guy, and he was paralyzed. He was bedridden. And uh, one day, after I wheeled other people back to their rooms, I, I came by to see William, and there were some people from, I think, his church visiting him. And they were hovering over his bed, and I eavesdropped. Is it wrong to eavesdrop? So I didn't know that. But if it is, I didn't know that, but I eavesdropped. And these guys were speaking quite uh, vigorously to William, who I loved, and saying, you know why you're paralyzed? This, this is what I heard. I don't know if I'm right. This is what I heard. You know why you're paralyzed? You're paralyzed because you sinned. And you deserve this. And you, maybe if you repented of your sin, you would be healed. That's what I heard. I was ticked off. I was really furious. I was outside the room like pacing, and I, I, I just was just really mad. I waited for those guys to go, and I said, William, I don't buy that at all, and, and I don't. However, when I was thinking about this story, I, I, I read it and thought about William, and, and I thought about the fact that I don't know how William came to be paralyzed. Maybe William was driving while intoxicated, Maybe he killed somebody, and maybe, you know, he got paralyzed in that accident, and maybe there was a certain amount of guilt that was associated with his paralysis. And so if, if I could pray for Jesus to come and w visit William, my natural inclination would have been what you would have thought Jesus would have done for the paralyzed guy in this story, and that is, Jesus, I'm hoping you go to visit William to heal him physically. But maybe William's greatest need, not knowing the full story of William's life, because I don't, maybe his greatest need wasn't actually physical healing. Maybe he did carry some guilt inside his spirit. Not that he was to be condemned the way he was being condemned, but maybe, maybe he needed forgiveness. Maybe that's why Jesus went to this guy and said, said what he said. He said, be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. Now watch what happens in the story next. The religious leaders that are there are ticked off. Watch what happens. It says some of the religious leaders, uh, some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking. And so he asked them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? And then the story goes on and Jesus ends up healing the guy. So the guy ends up being healed. But the question he asked was, of them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Question this morning. Has anybody in the last week thought some not, not so nice thoughts? Anybody here have a, some less than perfect thoughts? Yeah. You know what? Sometimes I've thought already, wouldn't it be cool to have Jesus with us in our lives today? Wouldn't that be cool? But when I thought about this story, I'm thinking, I'm kind of glad Jesus isn't around, aren't you? Because imagine, and those of you who raised your hands and were honest, the rest of you were dishonest, but those of you who raised your hands and were honest about your evil thoughts, can you imagine, Glenn raised his hand, can you imagine Jesus, I haven't, I haven't picked on you for quite some time, Glenn, so I thought you were overdue. But, I mean, whatever your evil thought was, seriously, what do you... What would your response be if Jesus was there in the place where you had your evil thought and Jesus all of a said, Glenn, you're with friends, you're in a, some type of public-ish setting, and Jesus said, why did you think that evil thought in your heart? What would your response be? My response would be to have my face turn red, like I'm exposed. Or, or I would get ticked off like, and, and try to deflect the attention off of myself by getting angry. But whatever the case, Jesus said, why did, why did you think such evil thoughts in your heart? 
Now, what were they thinking? Listen, the scripture tells us a bit of what they were thinking. It says in the previous verse, the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Now, you know what? I'm not sure that that's such a bad thing to think. For example, if Caitlin was interacting with somebody who had done wrong, and Caitlin said, I forgive you, you be, be free, what would your question be about that? Like, hey, do you have the right to do that, Katie? I mean, who do you think you are? And, and that's kind of what they were saying in their minds. Like they were saying, they were challenging whether Jesus had that right or not. To some degree, I understand the question, but there could have been a lot more in their minds than simply that. Just, hey, do you have that right to do that? They might have been like, hey, this is our job. Some of us are priests here. And the job is when you do wrong, you come to the temple and you bring your animal and we sacrifice it in the altar and we do that kind of thing and you're treading on our turf, so get out of our face. And that could have been behind them when they said in their minds, that's blasphemy, does he think he's God? Like, who does this guy, there could have been a lot. Not only that, but they could have in their minds had animosity against the guy laying in the stretcher. Could have been frustrated with the guy in the stretcher himself because maybe they knew a bit of his past themselves. I mean, think about it. Jesus did forgive the guy in the stretcher. There was something that he had done wrong, and maybe there was in their mind some knowledge of what he had done wrong, and may have thought maybe really behind their statement was, what are you doing, Jesus? Don't you have any idea what this guy has done? Why are you forgiving him and letting him off the hook like that? Now, why I would think that is because of what happens in the very next verse. In the ninth verse, right next to that, the same people may have been hanging around Jesus. And in the very next verse, Jesus goes walking along, interacts with Matthew, the tax collector, says to Matthew, come and follow me. And shortly thereafter, Matthew has this, this party, and a lot of people are there that are shady in their, in their nature. And, and Jesus is sitting down with them, and the the same people that said, why is he forgiving? He's doing blasphemy. Who does he think he is God? The very same people said, why does your teacher eat with such scum? And so they may have thought very negatively of Jesus and very negatively of the person and thought, you have no right to forgive this person. If you knew what he did, he doesn't deserve any forgiveness. And so Jesus hears them or he knows their thoughts and he says, why do you have such evil thoughts in your heart? Now, let me go and make it more personal. Let's pretend, let's pretend that, that the person in the stretcher is somebody that did something against your family, okay? Engage with me for a moment. Let's say that the guy in the stretcher did something really nasty to members of your family, to someone in your family, okay? And, and, and then, after he did something horrible to your family, you love your family, did something horrible to your family, sometime after that, the guy was painting his house. And he had a ladder leaning up against the second floor window. He's painting the window frame of the house, and something happens where he falls off the ladder, hits the ground, and ends up getting paralyzed. He, and, and, and so that's the result of his injury. Now, he did something in the past against your family. It was very, very nasty. And now he falls and gets paralyzed. Here's the question. What's your reaction to the news that he got paralyzed? What are you thinking? And keep in mind you're in church. Like tell the truth. Don't tell the religiously right answer. Tell the truth. He did something nasty to your family. He falls and gets paralyzed. What's your reaction? Nobody's saying anything? People in the first service responded. What's your, yes! Am I right? There's a little bit of, come on, let's be honest. There's a little bit of that inside of us. There's a little bit there. And if Jesus, I'm so glad he's not here, aren't you? If Jesus was there, the guy fell from the ladder, got paralyzed, and you, you heard about that, and the moment that you heard about that, you said inside of you, not out loud, because we want to give the impression, oh, that's too bad. That's what I would say. Oh, that's too bad. I'm really sorry to hear that. We'll have to pray for him. But we're inside. I'm saying, yes. In the moment that I say in the inside, yes. If Jesus said to me, 
Randy, why do you think such evil thoughts inside your heart? My face would turn red. I'd be embarrassed. And, and, but Jesus' question, I don't think, was intended to be embarrassing. I don't think Jesus planned to embarrass me and make, make me humiliated. I don't think that's what he wanted to do. Instead, I think he wants to get me to think. So watch what happens in the story. Put yourself in the story. This guy is coming along. He's, uh, he's been brought to Jesus on a stretcher. The guy that has injured your family or hurt your family in some kind of way. The guy about whom you said yes when he was paralyzed. And you see the guy, this, I can't stand him. Can you stand him? Oh, I don't want you to know my thoughts. Sorry about that. They're bringing the guy in a stretcher, friends, and I see the, the guy being brought to Jesus. What are my thoughts now? What am I thinking? I know what Jesus is going to do for this guy. What's Jesus going to do, I'm thinking? He's, Jesus is going to heal the son of a gun. Right? And what I think about that, I don't want Jesus to heal him. That's just evening the score. My daughter's paralyzed. If she's paralyzed, he should be paralyzed. I don't want Jesus healing. So I'm, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Then Jesus comes along and he does something even worse than heal the, 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 the person. What's Jesus do? He says, I forgive. But it's worse than that. Listen to this. This will rot your socks. This will make you vomit. The, the, the guy's brought to Jesus. He doesn't immediately heal him. Instead, the guy says, of the individual that wronged your family viciously, Jesus says, of that man, be encouraged, my child. Oh, makes you sick, doesn't it? That makes you sick. Be encouraged. So loving. Be, be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. Makes you sick. Right at that moment of sickness and revulsion, you say to yourself inside your head, Jesus, what, what, who do you think you are forgiving this guy? What right do you have forgiving this person? This person wronged my family. Who do you think you are forgiving them? And in that moment of that ire, Jesus says, Randy, why do you think such evil thoughts in your heart? That's a good question. That's a second quadrant question that's important, but not urgent. And because it's not urgent and because I don't even want to think about it, I'm not going to spend any time there. But it's an important question that we should reflect about. Here's the question that you should answer. It's not just a question for this guy. Why do you think such evil thoughts in your heart? Now, note. This isn't an accusation on the Jesus' part. He's not trying to criticize you. He's trying, what's the purpose of his questions? If he already knows the answer, he's not trying to find out an answer. What he's trying to do is to get you to do what? To think. So here's a question, folks. Engage with me. This is for you, from Jesus. Why do you think such evil thoughts in your heart? It's intended to get you to reflect, to think about that. Why do you do that? It, the implication in this is that I have evil thoughts. First question would be, what are my evil thoughts? Now, last week I told you, if you were here, that the sermon stunk in one respect. And the reason it stunk is the right way to preach this sermon is not the way I'm preaching it. What I should do at this point is say, you know what we're going to do now? We're going to stop. And I'm going to send you out of the building and take a half hour walk and spend some time thinking and reflecting. That's what we should do. And then come back and we'll finish the service. I won't do that because we're under a time frame. But that's what we should do. And we should do it because if I don't make you do it, you know what you're going to do? You're going to walk out the door, shake my hand, say, that was a nice sermon, Pastor, and move on your way. That's not what it's about. This is a second quadrant issue. This is important, not urgent. We should think about it. So let's assume that you take your walk. What should you do? As you're thinking about the question, why do you, Randy, have such evil thoughts in your heart? As I think about that, the first thing I think I should do is to pray and say to God, God, what are my evil thoughts? I'm not even aware of them. What evil thoughts are in my mind right now? That's what I should ask. And then beyond that, I should begin to pray and say, God, uh, why are they there? 
Why are they there? When I was preparing the sermon, I, was, I took a walk. And, and I remember where I was in the road. I always have physical memories. And I remember thinking to myself about seeds. Maybe the plants were just growing up in the farmer's fields. Or maybe I was anticipating planting corn in my garden. I don't know. But I thought about this question. Where did the seed of this evil thought come from? Where did it come from? And then I thought, what happened to plant this seed of this evil thought in my heart? And then I thought, how did I water this evil thought in my life? And then I thought, what can I do to kill this evil thought that's in my life? Let me, let me illustrate what I'm talking about. Do you remember the story of the Amish people in Lancaster County where the gunmen went in and killed all the school children? That's, that was horrible. And, and he went in, and, and what did the Amish do in response to that? Do you remember? They did what? They forgave, and I read this. It says, on the day of the shooting, a grandfather of one of the murdered Amish girls was heard warning some young relatives not to hate the killer, saying we must not think evil of this man. Another Amish father noted, he had a mother and a wife and a soul, and he's standing before a just God, and they forgave him. It said that 30 people went to the funeral of the guy who had killed their loved ones. And, and, and I thought about their forgiveness and how that transformed them, but let's pretend that they didn't do that. And let's pretend that today, 11 years later, they do or say something that's evil in its nature. An Amish person here, an Amish grandfather, says or does something that's evil, and it's evident that he has evil thoughts in him. And let's say Jesus says to this grandfather, why do you have this evil thought in you? Why would it be there? It would be there because they allowed that evil thought to be planted years earlier. Let's pretend that instead of tearing down that schoolhouse and removed it, they put a plaque on the schoolhouse itself. They moved the children to a different building, but they put a plaque on the schoolhouse, and the plaque in the schoolhouse said, here's where the blankety-blankety-blank guy named so-and-so came in and killed our children. That would be the moment that that seed of hatred was planted in their hearts. And every time they drive past that schoolhouse that continues to exist, they're watering it. I can't stand what happened here. And they dwell on it. And the only way it just grows and grows and grows. And so now, 11 years later, I am angered about something. I'm bitter about something. And Jesus catches my thought. And Jesus says to me, Randy, why do you have this evil thought in your heart. And when I go out walking in the cemetery and praying, he brings me back to that. Here's my point. We have evil thoughts in us. We have evil thoughts in us. We do. And, and, and the question is, how do I get rid of them? First, I need to acknowledge that I have that evil thought in my mind. I have evil thoughts in me. And I need to take some time and I need to pray. And, and the, the woman said, in the, in the teaching, the, the professor said, the only way I'm going to get rid of that is to replace that with positive thoughts. And what I was doing, or some positive action, what I was doing when I was watching that video was thinking about the funeral service of an Amish person, of those Amish children. I was thinking what that would look like. And I went in my mind's eye to, a, to the funeral service. My father and stepmother Mary are close friends with an Amish family. My father and Mary drives for them. Their names are Ben and Anna. Ben and Anna, uh, it's their second marriage. They both have grandchildren that come together. You know how many grandchildren Ben and Anna have collectively? 50. <laughs> 50 grandchildren. And, uh, and I, remember, I know Ben and Anna. And you know where they worship? You know where they worship, the Amish people? They worship in each other's homes. Lots of people. And here's where I went when I was watching that video. I thought to myself what that funeral service was like in their home. I assume it was in their home. And I think about the casket of the child. 
and I think about the people singing. What were they singing about? They were singing about heaven. They were focused on heaven. That was like that, that video clip where it says, my surgery 70% successful versus 30% failure rate. And they were singing about heaven and they were focusing on the positive hope of life beyond the grave in Jesus Christ. And they turned it all around. And that's what I'm suggesting to you. Here's the reality for me. Is it true for you? I have evil thoughts in my mind. Do you have evil thoughts in your mind? I, I do. It could be about somebody that's done something wrong against me. And Jesus is questioned, why do you have that evil thought in your heart? It could be some conflict in my marriage. Why do you have that evil thought against your spouse? It could be an, an evil thought of lust. Why do I have that lustful thought? It could be a thought of taking revenge. It could be a thought of gossiping. It could be a thought of being judgmental. And the question Jesus is asking is, why do you have this evil thought inside of you? That's an important, not urgent question. And I'm challenging you to examine that. And having examined it, let's destroy that thought. The way the Amish went about doing that was to forgive. And when I think about forgiveness, and I think about hatred, the word, I have one word that I prefer over the other. Which word do you prefer over the other? Hatred or forgiveness? Man, hate, forgiveness is the word. Forgiveness is like the 70% and hatred is the 30%. I want to challenge you this morning to hear Jesus asking you this question. I want to challenge you to take a walk and reflect. Okay, anytime you want. And as you reflect, the questions are in the bulletin. Take a walk and pray to God and say, God, what evil thoughts do I have in my heart? And I bet you anything, he's going to reveal it. He's going to reveal evil thoughts in all of us, including me. And then ask him why. Lord, help me understand why I have these evil thoughts. Help me understand and then help me to destroy those evil thoughts now because I want to be pleasing to you. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we confess this morning that we have evil thoughts in our hearts. Those religious leaders, those religious teachers, teachers aren't the only ones with evil thoughts. We're, we're, we're part of them. We confess it to you. And we pray that you would reveal those thoughts and help us to overcome them. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, reveal them and help us to overcome them and help us to, to have your heart and your mind. We thank you for the testimony of the Amish in, in, in showing us the example of how to forgive. And we pray that we would similarly be able to release those evil thoughts be set free from them. Just work right now, Lord God. If there's anybody here in this room that's really battling in this area, maybe for many of us, for many of us, this is more theoretical than real, but there's some people sitting right now on the edge of their seat because there's an evil thought that's been plaguing them for a persistent length of time. Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, break them free of that evil pattern of thinking. Help them break free of that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Break them free of that. <laughs> Just as I'm praying, I'm thinking about somewhere in the country right now, we have so many acts of violence committed. So many acts of violence. And that, those acts of violence begin with thoughts. And I'm not suggesting this morning that anybody in the room right now is contemplating an act of violence. But there are evil thoughts in us that gain a power that supersedes our imagination. And if there's any evil thought that's just gaining momentum and getting stronger and stronger and stronger inside of anyone, and it has any application whatsoever, I pray against it in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would help them be set free from that. By the power of your Holy Spirit, just set them free. Lord, break through and set them free. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Ah, that is a beautiful sound. The sound of the voices rising up and praising God. 
We just thank you for this message today, Lord. And we just ask that you allow us, that you make us slow down. We just don't stop and take the time to think these types of messages through, Lord. So I just ask that today you help us find that time. It's important, but not urgent. But maybe in some way, Lord, it really is urgent. So help us move it to the right box today so that we take that time to be with you, to think about where we need to place our heart and our mind. Lord, we just ask that you be with us, that you guide those thoughts. We also ask that you're with us when those other thoughts come into our minds, whether it's while we're sitting in a meeting, maybe we're driving down the road, maybe it's from the moment we wake up in the morning. We just need you to be there to help us see that this thought needs to be removed. It needs to go. We love you, Lord, and we want to give all the praise to you. We want people to know that we are Christians and that we follow you. But we want to give the right message. And so in order to do that, we have to free ourselves. Forgiveness is so hard. So we just ask that you strengthen us today and we will find a way. When we have that thought that comes into our mind, when we have that feeling in our, in our heart, in our gut, that we just want bad for somebody else, that we know that you're there and you're helping to guide those thoughts in a different direction. We love you, Lord, and we are so thankful for this life you've given us. Allow us to change ourselves so we can glorify you. Be with us today and as we go into this week. And we offer all of this up in your name. Amen.